hello everyone and welcome to the Intralingo World Lit podcast where we look at other ways of seeing and being in the world through books. I'm Lisa Carter, founder and creative director of Intralingo. And uh, today I am so pleased to be featuring the translator from the Turkish, Paula Darwish. Hi, Paula. Hi there, hello there. So great to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and today we're going to speak primarily about um, the book Children of War by the Turkish writer Ahmet Yorulmaz. But of yeah. course, we'll we'll go and talk a little bit about about your work in general as well. But uh, I'd love to hear how you were first introduced um, to this book, Children of War, and and then how you came to translate it. Okay. Uh, well, unbelievably, I first uh, read the book in 2001, so it's been quite a long process. Yeah. And, um, and I, it was also quite coincidental that I found the book. Um, it was via a friend of mine who is actually an English guy, but he speaks Greek. His wife was Cretan, and he was in Turkey, and he had a meeting with Ahmet Yoromaz, who was alive at that time. And um, he was fas fascinated by that history and he'd lived on Crete. And um, he met Ahmet, he talked to him about the book, and then he brought back a copy for me and got it signed by Ahmet Yoromaz. And he called me and said, oh, you, you really love this book, Paula. So I read it and, uh, and I did look really, I just really, you know, like how it is sometimes, you just yeah. really love a book. Mm -hmm. And um, and I immediately just thought, oh, I must trans. Everyone must, must read this book, you know. <laughs> must <laughs> tell the world. But at the time, I wasn't working as a translator, so um, I it wasn't very realistic of me to uh, do that. But I did contact the the author, and and I spoke to him, and he was really pleased. I wanted to translate it. And, um, and I started the process of asking for the English language rights and so, so on. But uh, to cut a long story short, of course I didn't do it. Uh, you know, I was too busy with other things, uh, but I always wanted to do it. And um, in 2000 and I think 2014, I started as a trans full-time translator. Okay. Um, because I studied Turkish at the university and I graduated in 97 and then I just did a whole load of other things right so um it was quite a long break at, that I had uh, but when I did I, it was the first thing I wanted to do was uh to translate this book um so that's how it eventually got done was when I was um actually working full-time and then I was in looked at, about investigated to how to find a publisher and so on right that's one thing I wondered as well, just because um, Ahmed passed away in 2014. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So did yeah. you work with him on this book at all? Or mm -hmm. was it after he had passed? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's this. No, it would have been great to have been. There was a few things I really wanted to ask him about. And it's quite a kind of specialist subject in a way you know and it's not easy to even ask other people you know there's a couple of things you mentioned and I wasn't sure whether they were you know if there were some other nuances to them and so on but but no I didn't I, I just I just know that I just spoke to him about doing it but that was it right yeah fair enough because um Ahmed Yorulmaz was a translator as well as a journalist and a writer yeah, yeah. Yeah, that would have been in some interesting conversations then from, you know, everything, the book, the history, yeah. um, but also his knowledge of, of exactly. translating. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly, because he translated a lot of Greek novels into Turkish. Right. So, um, yeah, and just some things about the, the story um, that the book is based on, um, and that he writes that the, the the story is based on the diaries of a Cretan refugee, uh, but I don't know where these diaries are and nobody knows. So there's things like that. I'd love to, to actually see the, that, the diaries. And Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so as an introduction, the Children of War is based on diaries, as you say, um, but it, they're fictionalized or we imagine to what extent <laughs> they're fictionalized. But also it, it is very personal because um, it tells the story of the population exchange in 1923 between Crete and Turkey from one boy's perspective, one man's perspective. But that's also the, the history of Ahmed Yorlmaz's family as well. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. was a very personal story for him. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and that... it, there's a, a lot of people who live, he lived in a town called Ivaluk in Turkey. And there was, uh, at the time, there was a, a huge population of descendants of the Cretans. Uh, at the time when he lived there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so interesting. He, um, I think one of the things I read in his bio as well is that pretty much most of his working life was in his journalism and in his writing was was dedicated to to friendship and, and rapprochement between um, the Turks and the Greeks. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, he was, um, I think that's the thing that I really liked about his book, um, because, I mean, there aren't many books at all in any language written uh, set up against the population exchanges. There's a couple mm -hmm. of Greek ones that I know of. Okay. I like his book because he's not trying to uh, blame any side, you know, he's not taking a sort of nationalist uh, stance on it on any side and although uh, somebody who read it thought it was a bit nationalistic but um i didn't sort of feel that maybe that was that was my translation <laughs> i didn't feel that when i read the turkish uh so that's what I, that's what appealed to me about it he's just sort of looking at the, the effects of on the ordinary people mm -hmm. exactly that's i have to say that's the thing i found most incredible about this book is that um, there's never a sense of of blame or as you say sort of bipartisan um, especially the character I mean which is how we're seeing everything through the character's eyes but he just sees people he doesn't see Muslim or Christian Greek and Turkish he doesn't see language or any of that he just sees people yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. It's quite something to um, to take a, a polarized subject, you know, that is very that has hurt a lot of people, hurt generations of people uh, and be able to portray that. Um, what did that feel like for you as a translator to to then convey something that does have so much emotion for so many? Yeah, I think. Um... Well, it may it sort of may be determined to do it, I think, and, and to find a publisher because, like you say, there's it is a quite a polarizing, you know, it's one of the polarizing thing, and um, it's not an easy thing to do to tell that story without sort of trying to offend this side or that side. Um, but uh, it was published in Greek, uh, you know, quite shortly after it came out in Turkish. Okay, um, and it just especially in the environment we're in at the moment, it made me feel really sort of passionate about um, not letting the history be hidden really. And otherwise people think, oh, you know, the kind of classic thing where people say, oh, they're always fighting each other, religious people, and they don't, oh, they don't get on. And but actually when you look at history, that's not the case. And that's, that was the, um, so I was really proud to translate it and mm. represent uh, you know, people, people that in the best of light, really. Yeah. The Middle people. Mm -hmm. And it almost seems to me, like you said, it, you know, took from 2001 until now to have it published you started working on it and in, in earnest in 2014 but it almost seems like 
now is the time for it to come out because just in the world, as you were saying, there's so much more um, partisan stances and the whole topics of um, immigration and refugeeism and yeah. what does it mean to be one ethnicity or religion. Um, yeah. Maybe it needed this time to, to come out and have some effect. Yeah, it, it certainly feels really, really relevant to me. And um, I think is it, it's you've read the book, you know, it's it's a very simple book, isn't it? It's not yes. sort of anything heavy in it in a way, although the topic is tra tragic. But it's it's a very simple book, but I think it's sort of it's thought provoking. It makes um, it does make these points about thinking about the your identity and why you why you think that you're you belong to this group of people because it's a, a the best thing about it is it's because it's through a child's eyes and so he's he's just sort of you know taking things on the surface value and saying well I, I come on I'm a Cretan you know how come I was a Cretan and now I'm supposed to be a Turk and mm -hmm. um yeah so uh it's a really important time um in terms of the fact also just uh but the fact that identities change and they're not this sort of national identity idea is a relatively new concept in sort of human history. And, um, but the, lots of people aren't aware of that, you know, people, well, we're taught in general that that's the way it's always been. And every country mm -hmm. in the world constructs its own national history as if it has always been there, but actually it hasn't. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's the other, like, really fascinating part of this book is um, exactly as you say, it's, it's told from the point of view of a, of a child, a young boy and his growing up and, you know, then there's the reflection of him as an older man. Um, but he does portray some of that history. Um, like you say, just very simply, you know, uh, in his own musings, you know, he's like, you know, if my family has been here for 500 years, you know, why am I not Cretan or, um, the, you know, the change of language or change of religion to, um, to establish themselves and then have to give it all up. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's just a, a, a fascinating a sort of um, thought, you know, I find it really fascinating, the idea that that, you, that people, you know, the way we think about identity now, the way we see ourselves is not the same as the way people saw themselves 100 years ago. And, uh, and you kind of think, uh, how did it feel to be someone even living in England uh, three, 400 years ago or anywhere? Mm -hmm. um, you would have had a different identity. You would have didn't necessarily think, oh, yeah, I'm English or I'm this, you maybe thought, you know, well, you might, you know, I'm French or Dutch or, right, or I'm a, you know, identified with your religion and just the sort of the different mindset, really, I think is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is. You, you say also that it's um, a, a simple story, and it is in so many ways. And I think that's another thing I was thinking about as I was reading it. Um, uh, and sometimes I don't always read the, the before matter, the, um, the information that is there, because I just like to experience the book first. <laughs> so I didn't realize at first that it was based on diaries. Yeah. Um, but it does have that sort of simple telling of a story. Um, it's, you know, it's not plotted or constructed. Yeah, yeah, yeah I like that about it. Yeah, me too. The other thing I really loved about it was uh, that it was a very sensual novel in that there's so many senses yeah. in terms of tastes and smells and uh, I can almost picture the landscape. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Did that really ring a lot of bells for for you as someone familiar, not necessarily with Crete, but yeah. um, just that way of looking at the world as well through? Definitely. Yeah, it's, it's very atmospheric. And I just, the thing about the food, I, for me, it's such, such a sort of Eastern kind of thing with the, the sort of the food. I was this sort of obsession about these sort of little dishes and met quite a lot of which are kind of quite difficult to make you know like stuffed pine leaves and these elaborate <laughs> dishes but it's it's something that I, it does it really reminds me of the east um the way this sort of real passionate thing about food and especially about the way your sort of your mother cooks it because she's from this particular region and this they, it just reminds me of being in Turkey now, you know, and there's always, oh, yeah, but you need to eat the um, this dish. And you need to try it from Malatya or it's better where we make, you know. And I just love <laughs> yes. that. I love it. It's so nice. It is. Yeah, it really made me want to try, you know, more <laughs> things. And uh, while I was reading, you know, to sort of create that environment. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I thought about the writing as well is um, it begin, the story begins and um, Hassan or Hassanakis is already in Turkey. The population exchange has mm -hmm. taken place. He's an older man and he's kind of reflecting on telling the story of his life. And mm -hmm. it really felt in the pacing as well that there was this old world um, slowness that it was not about getting to the end it was about the day by day mm, yeah yeah I think that again is something that I really it's almost like something that can be overlooked about the book because it's obvious it's about such a big topic the population exchanges but it is about the thing like exactly like you said about this sort of the end of the old world and the start of modernity and the, the lifestyle, especially I think you see that through Hassan Arkis's father and his sort of realization uh, that things are going to change and that people, his son needs to be able to count and he needs to read yes. and uh, the, the way, I, there's a part where he says, he talks about the porters that carry the, the loads for people and um, that they're soon they'll, they'll have to read that the city's developing the town's developing so much they won't be able to remember where where to go and they'll so he, he says something like oh you won't even be able to be a, a porter if you can't read soon right and um but like you said also also i think this the, for me the the other feeling i get is this feeling of things having been the same for hundreds of years and then so to be in, to live through that era where things have been the same and like seem to be moving quite slowly then to suddenly be thrust into this incredibly radical change is just you just can't imagine it's kind of shocking that they do think about it well, it's a bit like that now actually <laughs> It is, isn't it? Yeah. And we can't just necessarily see it because we're in the middle of it, but yeah. maybe after. Yeah. <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It it's it requires that reflection later of our of our own journals and diaries. Yeah. Yeah. I do think that's a really important part of the book, is this the end of the the old world and the start of the modernity and well, I don't know actually the technical term modernity which period it, it refers to but um, yes. uh, but there's the start of really big changes and people needing to uh, read and write and so on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and Hassan himself is very um well suited to that I, it was encouraged by his father of course and uh and even his mother you know after they leave their village and um as a result of you know cultural tensions ethnic tensions and he moves to the city um before he you know is repatriated to turkey but he um you know he learns 
the printing business and yeah. he learns to um you know sell and negotiate real estate and he learns he learns turkish yeah uh, yeah yeah i think it's, it's also it's very much a story about his sort of survival and uh and how he kind of yeah he's uh like most people who are refugees they they're sort of pushed into this sort of situation where they have to do whatever they they can do and he gets Hassan Arkis gets some lucky breaks with um the the uh, the Greek printer um and then uh, like you say getting into the uh, the real estate world um mm -hmm. but yeah it's it's very true to life you know I can think of people that I know who come to England as, uh, you know, with nothing, absolutely nothing and done the work, awful jobs and and then ended up, they, you know, with a few shops in London and, and you know, it's just amazing yes. how people do it. It is, yeah. I, I um, was noticing as well that um, the, uh, the publisher, Neem Tree Press, their website also has really amazing resources on this book page yeah. that kind of paint a fuller picture of, of the past, of the time this was happening. Yeah. And um, as well as there's even a story of a, of a Syrian refugee. Yeah who also was, you know, of, of Cretan heritage um, and wound up back there speaking, you know, Greek with a, <laughs> a Northern Crete accent. And uh, it's pretty incredible to, when you see the book in context of, of today. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, the Cretan diaspora is, is all over the, the Middle East, um, like Lebanon, um, not all over the Middle East, but in a lot of countries, like you say, the Syria, mm. probably not in Syria anymore, but um, there, like, there was the story that you mentioned, um, lots in, in Turkey. Um, yeah, it's, it's just an in incredible, um, uh, incredible, historical event that happened really mm -hmm. you can't imagine mm -hmm. uh, it could be any of us were told that oh actually you're not who you think you are you're actually part of this other country now by kind of thing yes yeah yeah it's unimaginable really um uh, I was in Turkey in 2007 I think it was and I had the opportunity to go to one of the cities that were abandoned um, uh, yeah. during the, the population exchange. Yeah. And it's a most incredible um, feeling to be there and see an entire yeah. city that is abandoned. You yeah. Know, that, yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. I, I, there's... Um, there's a few of those that I've seen on on the um, on the island of uh, well I saw one on, on Lesbos and okay. I've seen one one of the villages in Turkey as well but yeah I saw one with that yeah it's just it's eerie isn't it to see mm -hmm. it's just been uh, just been left there and but one of the most poignant things I, that I read about when people left I don't think he mentions this in the book was that what they were mocked, people were mocked for taking bits of the house with them. I think in the, the newspapers of the time, um, when the, the, the sort of Cretan Muslims arrived in Turkey, uh, they were mocked for taking these bits of the, even bits of the door with them and things like that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, wow, that, that's incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, I, it was really interesting to me too, of course, um, Ahmed Yoralmaz is Turkish, but pretty much the whole story takes place, or at least this, this first book, because I do understand it's a trilogy and I want to ask you about that. <laughs> but um, um, uh, so it's not, 
it's not seen from the Turkish perspective, but it's written in the Turkish language. Yeah. Uh, and that, of course, is where, where the book begins. But I'm just curious for your insights on, on that, on that, um, you know, what, what made this a Turkish novel? Um, and how do people from Turkey, you know, that you've interacted with, see this whole time period and and what insights did that give you for the translation um as for, i think it's not very much talked about there was a period mm -hmm. i'm trying to remember when it was i think it was 2009 and 2010 when uh, it was talked about a lot and there was this sort of rapprochement um and there were visits uh the people went back to their villages in Crete they hadn't been been there uh, and the vice versa you know people who'd come from Turkey went back to see the villages in Turkey and meet their the descendants of their neighbors wow. um, and at some of the programs that are, are linked to on the Neem Tree website are from that period there was a documentary in Al Jazeera uh, there was a, a couple of different programs made about it and um so there was this rapprochement then um but apart from that it's not very much talked about and i think in a way it's for some people it's a it's a kind of for, for, from the turkish side it's it's a um it's a uh how can i put it a bit embarrassed an embarrassment really it's sort of you know, it's a loss of the island, right. part of the, although, you know, it was the Ottoman Empire then. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that, uh, you know, that people, I mean, I suppose it could be portrayed as a, a victory on one side, but at the end of the day, people lost everything. And then when they arrived in these new countries, it wasn't like they were welcomed with open arms. They had a really hard time. People mocked them. They didn't speak the language. So I think for that reason, it's not probably something that is a, a very celebrated part of Turkey's mm -hmm. history. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, but I think it's, there's a sort of, it's a niche, a niche market in a way in terms in, in Turkey, I've met uh, a few people who write on the subject, and they okay. do tend to be you know, descendants. That there's um, people who I, I've seen a couple of books from the people who were from the other islands, like Hios, um, nice bars. So um, yeah, that's that's all I can say. I think. Mm hmm. It's it, that's interesting to me because, you know, it's certainly not a part of history that, you know, I grew up in Canada. We certainly, you know, if we were lucky enough to get world history. It, it didn't, you know, really talk about about that period or or what happened. Um, uh, so it is interesting to me that it's also not that. Um, you know, prevalent even in in Turkey to to study that history or yeah, yeah. I I mean, I think most people are aware of this. It's not whereas, for instance, in the UK, nobody knows anything about it. Uh, but um, but it's just not talked about uh, mm -hmm. very much. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I as think that I you're right. Yeah. <laughs> I think that comes across in the book, though, too, because one of the, you know, things I took away from the story as well is this notion of, you know, it's, it's the empires, it's the governments, it's the grander scale that um, comes to these treaties, makes these treaties, and then it's, it's just the ordinary people who then have to cope with those yeah. monumental decisions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's um yeah, and then that comes across a lot in the in the book with the the Greek printer who's very very philosophical about these things and he sort of predicts what's going to happen. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, he does. As you say, though, like it, it, the book is not at all. Um, I mean, it, it's it's a difficult topic, and certainly, even you know, Hasanakis has terrible things happen to him. You know, he loses his father and his brother um, in the ethnic violence before um, they get to the city, and then, of course, there's years of sort of. Um, hints and intimations that this population exchanges could take place. And um, so it's not that he doesn't have a difficult life in some ways, but the book is not, it's not tragic. It's not, um, it's actually quite, quite hopeful, quite positive. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's quite an amazing achievement really of the writer uh, that despite if, if you sort of tell the story, it sounds like you think, oh, I don't want to read that. But actually, yes. <laughs> it's it's not like that at all. It's very much about him, a, a boy growing up. And, and, and I guess that's the thing, isn't it? That people in all these tragic situations are just like everybody else who's not in the tragic situation. They still like their food and they still... You know, they like their, he likes his women, his voluptuous yes. great women. And <laughs> um, yeah, they're just ordinary people trying to survive. And it's his story, which is the, the thing that kind of pulls you into the, the book, really. You know, his, yeah, his intrigues and so on. Mm -hmm. He's quite a funny character. <laughs> Yeah, you know, he's lighthearted. And uh, as you say, he's, uh, he, he does love his, his voluptuous Greek women, and yeah. he feels quite the, the man about yeah. town. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So what were some of the things that you, um, that you enjoyed most about about actually doing the translation of the book in terms of language or, yeah. Um, hmm. <laughs> uh, that is a difficult question. I or the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's easier. Um, now, I think I, I enjoyed doing the research. I did a lot of research because, uh, because Ahmed wasn't alive to ask. And so, I was, there were a few things that I just, you know, I couldn't work out in my head from the knowledge that I had. So I did enjoy that, uh, getting really sort of bogged down in all the research uh, about the actual real specific um, timeline of historical events, which is totally confusing because it, the First World War was just totally confusing. You can't, you know, I tried yes. to sort of put all these events in a list and I just thought, oh God, it's just so complicated, all mm -hmm. these events battles going on all the time uh, but um, I, I did enjoy doing the research and I enjoyed I just enjoyed the sort of challenge of getting across the, the thing that we talked about this sort of sensuous descriptive language and how to get that across uh, to people who wouldn't know the references mm -hmm. you know what I mean like with the, the dishes or I don't know, just, you know, how it is with sort of sim things are symbolic, aren't they, in different cultures, and we all associate certain, have different associations for objects. So I was, a, there was quite a challenge with that, with all this sort of things that he mentioned, and there's some of the foods were symbolic of certain occasions. I think there's one that's to do with mourning, and so I, I, I really did enjoy that, and you know, delving into the, the, the food. And <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, how, how it was, uh, yeah, how it was made, and and so on. So that was the bit that I enjoyed most. Um, but yeah, the most difficult thing was just not have being able to ask the writer about things I wasn't sure about. Um, so there were a couple of historical things that I I couldn't get my head around, and uh, mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if it was he'd made an, a mistake or. There was a particular reason why he'd done that. I just right. couldn't ask. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's hard, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just was a couple of things with the language. There's some some mm. of the things that he mentioned, which were sort of 
I guess we're kind of Cretan, um, Cretan terms, okay. but he's written them in Turkish, or maybe it were, they were Cretan Turkish terms for things. And um, it, yeah, it was hard for me to trans to be sure about the translation of them because I actually literally didn't know who I could ask about it. I, I mean, I do have uh, Cretan friends, but they're not, they don't have that knowledge of, it's such a sort of specific thing, you know, because he yes. came at this certain period. It was written in, it, well, he's referring back to a specific period. And um, that sort of language has probably been lost now, that sort of d dialect, if you like, or specific way of speaking. Yeah, right. Yeah, and you do, you know, let me um, clarify, I didn't read all of the surrounding material before I read the story, but I absolutely <laughs> did read all of it. And you provide a really wonderful uh, translator's note that, that does outline some of that history because it was com completely unfamiliar to me as well, the details for sure. And certainly before I had gone to Turkey to that village, I had no idea yeah. so you know that's a really important thing and um and the glossary as well um, yeah. about the food items and the a yeah. little more information yeah mm -hmm. in a conversation i was i just had with uh with another translator from from the montenegrin or the serbian she was wondering about this notion of familiarity and and do we need to um you know do we need to be familiar with the history and the yeah. the, the context um to to have an experience of a book and i'd yeah. love to know your thoughts on that as well like as a reader not just a translator yeah well we had a lot of discussions about that the, the publisher and I and, mm -hmm. the, and the editor um and I I thought actually we didn't particularly need the glossary but there, there is a glossary that was the decision made by the publisher in the end I thought I would have preferred to have just woven the descriptions into the story um, and I think we could have managed that okay um, but I think well I've t I tested the book after I did my first draft translation I tested it on someone who didn't know anything about the history at all mm -hmm. and um, and she enjoyed it so um, you can read that book without knowing anything about it without uh, I think it's it's self-explanatory. I think the first, the first, the very beginning of the book, it has so much detail in it. That's probably the, the hardest bit to kind of get through as a reader. Um, but I think, so that's, you know, it can be a negative point, but the positive side of that is that he does put in all the detail necessary if you don't know anything about the history. Mm -hmm. but, but later on in the book, there are more things that he refers to that if you were a Turkish reader, you would know what he was talking about. Um, that I know that an English speaking reader would have no idea about. So right. I did um, work in some sort of explanations into the text, if you like, mm -hmm. but they, they weren't explained in the, in the Turkish. So yes. in, yeah, in so... Really, I think you don't have to have the big historical explanation. Uh, but hopefully, if you enjoy the book, you do what you did and then you read about it afterwards. Mm -hmm. You want to know more. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. I was wondering that about the, the shorter, smaller notes at the end of the chapters as well. Were those um, your input or were those there in the original? I wondered be because... Yolmaz was a was a journalist whether he included those um do you mean the footnotes yeah footnotes. Mm -hmm. the footnotes are all about no they're all to do with the translation okay yeah 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 they're great oh uh, good well that was a big discussion as well because uh you know some people say no we shouldn't have well it's a they're different approaches you know sometimes mm -hmm. it's better not to have footnotes uh, but the publisher thought that in this situation, 
it was you know it was helpful to have them if people didn't want to read them they didn't have to read them mm -hmm. yeah I read the the ebook version and um so I really just read them at the end which is when they appear at the end of the chapter <clears throat> they appear so they didn't interrupt the flow of reading at all and mm. I did find exactly what you're saying I didn't need them mm. everything was was clear and I you know um, even if it wasn't I was just following along through Hasanaki's eyes yeah um, but then to get that detail um, at the end to me it it makes it richer and I'm you know I have also been a literary translator and and in any book I ever translated I actually was against footnotes <laughs> so it's kind of funny now that as a reader <laughs> I can uh, you know really find the benefit in them too yeah yeah there's there's no right or wrong answer is there it's no. just those things you just yeah. have to make a decision and go with it exactly yeah totally and and I do think it's about adding to to the experience of the book and uh, especially um why I think they're particularly good here is again just this whole notion of what you know Ahmed Yoramaz did for a living which was to you know bring to light this part of history and to share it and um I think the better our understanding the more he ultimately achieves his purpose yeah so yeah for that reason alone I think it was good to have the extra explanations because it's sort of uh, reporting a piece of history in in another in English that wouldn't necessarily be known about which is mm -hmm. a really important thing to do just to help people understand the world better mm -hmm. yeah 100 percent yeah I so agree with that. <laughs> so um, it does say, as I mentioned uh, as well, that this um, is or was to be the the first book in a in a trilogy. Are mm. there two more books, and <laughs> can we look forward to them? Um, there are two more books. Yeah, um, we were hoping to uh, publish another another one, possibly the second and third book together. Um, but I'm not sure if it's going to happen or not, to be honest. Mm. I hope so, hard. but um, I felt the second book was, um, it brings in a whole load of different issues. Okay. Uh, which, again, would need sort of further explanation about the experiences of the Cretans when they arrive in Turkey. Mm -hmm. And... Um, goes into quite a bit of detail about the sort of class relations between the people that came from different islands and some people got given better sort of shops and properties and so on. Um, but also I, I felt like there were too many new characters in and the the part about Hassan Arkis doesn't come in until sort of later on. And so it wasn't and it, it, it wasn't a sort of, it's not a decision that can be taken sort of lightly, if you like. It doesn't follow right. on that easily from the first book it's almost like it could be a se separate well it, I mean, it is a separate novel but um yeah it's it would be it's going to be a whole sort of work on its own but maybe to join it with the third book okay um which does sort of pick up the story of Hassan Arkes and his um you know love life if you like so <laughs> Can, can't not have more of that yeah <laughs> yeah so I, I don't I don't know what's mm. going to happen about that mm. at stage. Mm -hmm. that's yeah. interesting that you say that it you know it, it kind of maybe cuts away from his life at the beginning of the second book because um the first book ends just as he arrives in Turkey yeah uh, and I actually, my notes say, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I was just expecting to turn the page and keep reading. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so it was a bit of a surprise that it ended there. Absolutely. But yeah. yeah, but it is also kind of a non-traditional way of storytelling, like I said, because it is journal-like. Um, I'm not sure if necessarily I would expect the next book to... 
um, specifically continue with him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure also that um, if the second books are based on the diaries of the, uh, the okay. same diaries, I, I'm actually not, could not clear about that. Um, right. I know there's some of the characters, I think, yeah, some of the characters are real characters and but some of them are mentioned in the first book. Some of the characters like Hassan Arkis's friends from the Taverna, they appear again. Uh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. There, that now that you've shared that, there is so much mystery and uh, intrigue behind this book, you know, yeah. it, it really would have been interesting to to know more yeah mm -hmm. yeah well we'll see what happens i, I don't know <laughs> yeah for sure publishing yeah. is hard yeah. <laughs> yeah it's hard but i i really really did um love this book i loved you know seeing um through Hasanakis's eyes, as I say, it just really felt like it took me to a, a different place and a different time and yeah. uh, and showed a lot that that I think is really important for us to look at and to see because it does have such relevance for today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there anything you'd especially like readers to take away from from Children of War? Um, the thing that I'd uh, like people to take away from it is to just to to sort of question uh, our our conceptions, if you like, of uh, identity and who who belongs where, and where those perceptions came from, and how long do you have to be somewhere before you're not a sort of immigrant? Um, is it the second generation or the third? And why are the other people who've been there? Uh, you know what I mean? You know, we're all immigrants at the end of the day. You know, we, if we want to go back through generations, uh, apart from maybe some islands somewhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. have a, so I think that's what I'd like people to take away from it is to think about um, those issues of, national identity and who why why do we think that people have uh, some people have more of a right to live in a place than others yeah i think that is such a good thing to to ponder and for us all to you know think about and, and what does it mean when we do think one way or or another mm -hmm. um about another person and I really think this book um, makes that so clear just in terms of you know that universal humanity yeah. we are all just attempting to live our lives and find work and you know prosper in some way yeah exactly exactly mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me today, Parla. Thank I you. really appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, it's so great. So um, thank you to everyone for, for listening or for watching, whether on YouTube or the podcast. Um, Paula Darwish's bio and information about the book will be in the show notes. Um, it would be wonderful to hear from other readers. So drop a comment. Uh, about this conversation, of course, um, go out to your local independent bookstore um, and get a copy of Children of War by Ahmed Yoralmaz. And uh, I'm sure Paula as well would love to hear what you think. Absolutely. So, yeah, good. So thank you for, for listening or watching, as I say, and uh, until the next time.